Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chin Fat. I've got a couple episodes I'm doing on compression. I've had some questions about compression and kind of clarifying what that is and, and how it works and what you're doing and why you would want to do it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between uh, compression and transcoding and the, need, and the need for each. In this episode and in the next episode, I've got two episodes I'm going to be doing on this. One is going to be the practical, one's going to be kind of the, the theoretical ideas behind compression, and then the next will be the actual lesson on compressing files and transcoding files. I've got a neat little PowerPoint here. It's neat because I made it, and uh, it's called Everybody Loves Compression. And the reason why is because it is incredibly exciting. Why is it exciting? Because it makes your work uh, a lot easier if you do some compression. We're going to kind of talk, well, and it depends on uh, if you're using something that was compressed in camera or if it is compressed uh, by you for specific needs. Uh, first of all, got to kind of understand what the word codec means. Because with video, you're going to have several different types of codecs. Uh, codecs are different, basically different languages. There's ways of, uh, and it comes from the words compression, decompression, which can also be considered as writing and reading. So decompression is your computer's ability to read the language, and write is the uh, is your computer's ability to write the language. One of these examples is uh, Apple ProRes is a very specific. They have very specific codecs. They have ProRes Proxy, ProRes LT, ProRes 422, ProRes HQ, and uh, ProRes 444, and some variations of uh, 444. And they are also having a ProRes RAW that's recently being released. And it is a very robust, very um, what I would call very efficient codec. Uh, uh, computers read it and write it very easily. And until recently, Macs have been the only ones that have been able to. Uh, right to those, right to that codec. Aside from cameras, you've had a, very, a whole bunch of different types of cameras that, you've been, that have been able to write to that codec. Uh, but more recently, uh, on within Adobe Premiere uh, and Premiere products and Media Encoder, PCs have finally been allowed not just to read it, but to write to it to kind of actually compress or what we would call transcode uh, to that specific codec. So there's a whole bunch of different codecs that are used for different needs and different. Some of them, like languages, can be more efficient than others and run better than others. And as the as time progresses better codecs have come out and become available. So yeah, as I mentioned, codecs are much like a language. Computer must learn the language before you read it or write it. It's kind of like the matrix, basically. You just like plug it into the computer's head and all of a sudden it's there. Sometimes you have to install it on the computer. Uh, if you have something like Adobe Premiere or other editing programs, a lot of codecs are already included and they're installed into the computer when, when, you, um, when you install the software. Another term that you got to be familiar with uh, is bitrate. Different codecs will have different bit rates. And bit rates uh, basically describes how much information there is per second in a stream of data. It's basically how large the file is, how much information, how much color information, how much data is stored in your video file. Uh, the important thing to understand that it, the higher the bit rate, the more information, and thus uh, the more effort it takes to decode that information, the more space it requires, and also the more bandwidth. You, and, and you'll have to have a better computer that, that processes quicker, have better video cards and, and uh, a faster and faster CPUs help out with uh, computers to read that data back. So a combination between like hard drive speed, processor speed, video cards will all help kind of determine how easily that video file will play back depending on the size of it. And bitrate is measured in how many bits or basically your computer data is delivered per second. Often this is measured in megabits per second. And this will be abbreviated, and uh, you can see here uh, in MBPS is what you'll oftentimes see as megabits per second. Typically, the higher the, uh, the data rate you have within a relative codec, uh, the higher quality that file will be. Not necessarily so, though. If you take a file, say it's like an H.264, a very specific type of codec that's used in cameras, that's, uh, you can get a very low bit rate. But the file looks high quality when you're just watching it visually, seems high quality. And that's a different type of compression that we'll talk about. But if that video file gets transcoded to ProRes, and the data rate is higher than that of the H.264 file when you're transcoding to ProRes, your quality is not necessarily getting better because you're adding redundant data to the file. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So typically speaking, the higher the, the, uh, the, the bit rate, the higher the quality can be. And this is one instance here. Video that's shot in ProRes 422, 1920 by 1080 at 24 frames per second has a bit rate of 117 megabits per second. As you go to ProRes HQ, you're going to get higher megabits per second. You're going to get higher quality. If you're shooting at higher qualities, it really depends on the camera. If you've got a camera that outputs to 10 
to, uh, to 10 bit quality. If it's not raw, if it's compressed footage, going above and beyond ProRes 422 uh, is going to be unnecessary. In, in most instances, it's going to be, it's just going to be redundant data that you don't need. And your files will be bigger and bulkier and tougher to deal with. But the need for compression here, as you see, most people in the U.S. have internet connections which can only handle up uh, to 15 to 35 megabits per second. Uh, this is one of the needs for compression. You have to compress the footage so your video footage can play back online. If you have, if you're trying to stream in ProRes at 100, ProRes 422 at 117 megabits per second, uh, it's just not going to happen on most people's internet connections. So that's one reason that we have for compression is so is so the videos can be played and watched online. Uh, there's other instances as well uh, if you have these files on your uh, if you deliver a file that's going to be viewed on a computer uh, sometimes it might be too big for the computer too much information for the computer to handle as well and therefore it needs to be compressed to something that the computer can handle if you're delivering a file to a movie house and they want something like a digital cinema cinema package that's going to have a set uh, bit rate that their projectors can handle that their projectors can play back and uh, that the projector can understand and stream consistently so one of the goals of compression is uh, to get the file size as small as possible while retaining visual and audio quality. A couple of little concepts here to introduce you to is what's what we call psychovisual uh, video compression and psychoacoustic audio compression. Uh, basically, they're, they're very similar. The concept behind these types of compression is basically there's so many frequencies. Let's talk about audio really quickly. There's so many frequencies that the human ears really can't pick up, and when you're recording and when you're recording audio, there are several frequencies that are uh, that are recorded. So all forms of compressed audio use powerful algorithms to discard information that basically the human ears can't hear. And it's very similar with psychovisual compression, but it's uh, dealing with uh, video instead. And actually, when it, when we say uh, video, I, I should be refer. I should let you know that I'm referring mostly to what's called color information within your file. Uh, color information takes up most of your of the information in a video file, and typically you have three channels. You have your red channel, green channel, and your blue channel within video. And say you're getting an image of the sky. If you're taking a picture, of, if you're taking video of the sky, you have a lot. You have heavy blues and not as many reds. Uh, when you're compressing, the, the compression software will analyze uh, the frame and determine what colors are present in the frame, and it will actually remove the colors that it does not need. And then the visual quality will be maintained, but it's actually removed information that's not being used. Now keep in mind that if later on you wish to take that file that's been compressed and do some color grading and migrate it more toward the red channel, uh, it's not going to happen as easily because you've actually removed that information. So oftentimes when it comes to color grading, it's best to stay, stick with the original files to do the color grade rather than trying to, rather than trying to color grade the compressed files. Now, a couple things to keep in mind here. Um, there's a couple different ways you can change your video and or audio. When you're, um, and one way is actually compression that we were talking about that's uh, typically referred to as encoding. Uh, that's making a file smaller by removing, hopefully, redundant information, as we mentioned, such as color. And the other type is transcoding. Transcoding is changing your file from one codec to another. Uh, one instance that this happens in, one, one reason for transcoding is to make your files work more efficiently within an editing software. Uh, I'm going to come back to this after we talk about the difference between iframe compression and uh, GOP compression. So to understand why you would rather why you would want to do transcoding or compression uh, is kind of explained in uh, these two different styles of compression here. One is called iframe, or uh, also referred to as intraframe, and the other one is GOP, uh, which is uh, also referred to as interframe. It's kind of confusing because they sound so similar. Uh, but first of all, iframe is a method of compression where each frame is compressed individually. This basically gives you a higher image quality. Uh, the files tend to be larger, and uh, this is typically the most efficient style of format for editing as well. Since every frame contains its own information, it's very efficiently for the computer to process each uh, frame individually. Uh, what happens with a uh, GOP or group of pictures essentially is what that refers to, uh, or interframe compression, is a method of compression where groups of frames are compressed together. And this yields a good image quality with very small files. It's best for like web videos and oftentimes for uh, when you're trying to get the, f the size of the file down as low as possible uh, while, keep, while maintaining a, a visual 
visual and audio quality. Uh, that's also you'll find a lot, a lot of like the DJI drones uh, that encode to H.264, even if it is an MOV. Uh, that's the MOV is just called like an extension or a wrapper. W R A P P E R, which basically just means that's what it's wrapped in. As it's, re it's reading as a QuickTime video, but it has a codec of H.264. Uh, AVC is also another common, commonly used one in, in cameras where they're trying to compress it and keep the, keep the file size down, uh, so you can fit a lot onto your, onto your solid state drive. Or the solid state drive might not be as fast as a reading card as some of the bigger SSD cards like you have in the red camera. So if they can't read, if they can't write uh, that, that heavy bandwidth, they got to compress the file down while trying to maintain visual quality. Now, what uh, group of pictures does? is as you are uh, transcoding a video clip, let's say this is kind of represents time here and you're encoding a video clip, what will happen is on a very specific keyframe, on one individual frame of, of the image, let's say once again you're shooting something that has like heavy uh, blue sky and maybe some green trees at the bottom, so you got some heavy greens and blues in it. Uh, and then let's say the next several frames is of the same shot. So you have the, the next several frames of your image are the same shot, it's staying consistent with the greens and blues. What it will do is it will borrow color information from this keyframe right here. This frame right here, it'll borrow the greens and the blues, and it will give that information uh, to each subsequent frame until the image changes. If the image suddenly changes, and you have a lot, and you got a lot of reds in the image, or it cuts to a different shot, or the camera pans to something else, another keyframe will be established, and then the next several frames will borrow that uh, information as much as possible. Uh, I apologize for my awesome uh, illustration here. Uh, this is my artwork, and I'm uh, the bidding starts at $10 for this image I made in Photoshop. And then once again, uh, codecs like uh, ProRes and DNX are very robust codecs and very efficient. That's why I call them efficient because the computer's doing a lot of processing when it's reading back to that keyframe to, uh, uh, add, to add color information to, this, to a bunch of subsequent subsequent frames that are borrowing from that one frame. It takes a lot more processing. So even these, even though these files are smaller. Uh, the the GOP pictures like ABC and H.264 files are going to be can be a lot smaller than the ProRes files. They don't run as well in editing, and we can even kind of demonstrate that. I'm going to open up Premiere. I've got a couple of files that were shot on a DJI drone here. Uh, one is this MOV. This is the original one that came out of the out out of the. Um, this is the original one that came off of the card right here. This MOV file, you'll notice, uh, these are the exact same length, and this one runs about uh, half a gigabyte. Now I've compressed this to a to ProRes proxy file here, and you'll notice that takes the the quality up, or that takes the data rate up, and now we have almost three times the size by transcoding it. We transcoded it from an MOV, which is 8.264, to ProRes. Uh, MOV file. So we have transcoded it from one codec to the next and it has increased the, f the file size. But you would think that this one would play back better on your system because it's a smaller file. But let's take these two into Premiere. And I'm going to drop the movie file. I'm going to drop the H.264 file into a timeline and I'm going to drop the ProRes file into its own timeline as well. So I have two different uh, timelines here and I'm going to move along here to this clip. This is the H.264. Now look what happens as I just scrub here. As I start to scrub, look how it just jumps from, it just jumps and jumps and jumps. It doesn't scrub very well. It's very choppy. I mean, once you stop and play back, it'll start processing and it'll eventually, but notice that lag there. Watch this. I'm going to, I'm going to hit J to rewind. It's play, it stops, 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 and there it goes. And it finally went, and it's still chugging a bit. And now when I go forward, and this is 4K footage, by the way. So notice this is 4K, uh, 4096 by 2160. So it's a, it's a lot of information to be dealing with. So now I'm going to play forward here. I'm going to hit L and play forward and watch how long it takes. I'm going to hit the key now. One, two, three. And it took about three seconds to start moving. You'll see this. You'll have this issue, especially as you get higher resolutions uh, with... Uh, um, codecs that are H.264 and ABC codec. Now let's go to the ProRes timeline and watch this. As I grab my playhead and I scrub through this, look how much quicker this scrubs and updates my video as I scrub through it. A lot smoother. And if I wasn't recording right now on um, on OBS, this would be processing even faster than this. But it moves a lot faster. It's a lot, even though the file is bigger, it's a lot smoother. Uh, as I press play on this, I hit L to go forward, immediate response. I hit J, immediate response to go backwards. And then I fast forward, it processes really quickly, it's not chopping at all, and it's a really, really smooth codec. So that's the difference between uh, intraframe and interframe. As I mentioned, iframe is going to be a lot more smooth and efficient, and uh, that is one reason. A lot of people, when they, uh, if you shoot 4K footage on a drone and it's choppy, 
and you don't want to do the proxy footage, try transcoding it to 4K footage. And once you and once you encode it to that ProRes footage, you no longer need your original footage because this is what we call lossless compression. It, um, it, it was transcoded to, to a higher data rate, therefore it has redundant information and it has not lost any quality at all. So this is called lossless compression, and you have no more need for the original for the original H.264 footage. I'd say don't delete it, just keep it in another folder, but you don't no longer have to access it. But keep the original in case you need it for some reason. Just to review that, uh, GOP compression records a keyframe every so often, a frame that contains uh, the entire image, image data set, whether the scene has changed or not. Uh, the keyframe is shot every X number of frames, usually about 15. It changes depending on uh, if you've got a variable frame rate or not. And that frame rate contains uh, a complete image for the next group of frames until the next keyframe. Uh, it's heavily compressed, containing only the changes from the previous keyframe. Really good for getting high quality looking footage on cameras. A lot of cameras use that just to get a high quality footage while keeping the file size down, but not a really good uh, a type of footage to edit from. So the way I kind of look at this is the iframe. I call it optimized footage and the long gop, the long gop or what they call long group of pictures once again is not optimized footage. So yeah, some other reasons for uh, compressing uh, a video, of course, need for storage space. Uh, need to transmit transmit uh, limited bandwidth, as we mentioned, and also ease in editing. Uh, so in some instances, say you're shooting on something like a RED camera that is really high quality, it's raw footage, it's not H.264, and it's basically every frame is, is, is has its own information uh, when you're shooting with something on a high quality cinema camera, like a, like a RED camera or, or a Canon or a Canon cinema camera or the Alexa or something like that. Uh, but sometimes, especially if you're shooting on the RED and you're shooting on a new camera that has, that shoots 8K which is an insane amount of resolution, uh, your computer's gonna have issues playing back. And that's where proxies come in. This is another time that you're going to need uh, to do possibly transcoding, but especially compression in this instance. I, I say transcoding because if you're using red footage, you can't really encode red footage to red footage. Red, uh, the only thing that writes to the red format, to the R3D format, is a red camera. Uh, you cannot use a computer. Uh, computers will not export out to it. Uh, so there's no way really to process it to a, a, an R3D file, of small, uh, a smaller R3D file that's more manageable. So you are going to transcode it. This gets a little confusing, but yes, we're going to take the R3D files and transcode them to something like ProRes Proxy, which is the, uh, the ProRes codec. But the files are also getting smaller, so that is considered what we call lossy compression. You're removing footage, you're removing footage, you're removing color information to get the file sizes smaller, uh, so they become more manageable and easier to edit. And the concept behind proxies is when you remove is when you have these smaller files, you can take out uh, the resolution, you can uh, decrease the resolution and typically the, the bandwidth and color information. Uh, they become more manageable. You're going to be able to edit your movie. And then when you're done and you want to do the color grading, you want as much color information as possible. So these are basically mirrored versions of your higher quality files. Once you're done editing, you relink them to the high quality files and then you can do the color grading on the original files and you have access to the full quality files after that. So just keep in mind uh, that after you do the compression on the lower quality files, uh, eventually uh, the higher, the highest possible quality files will replace the lower ones for the final edit and for, and for things like color grading. Just to kind of show the definitions that I was talking about before, when you compress a file and make it smaller, uh, you're always irretrievably throwing away uh, inf uh, information and data which cannot be recovered. That is called lossy compression. Things that will bring the size of your file down are these items right here. First of all, frame size or what we call resolution. Uh, if you have like 4K footage, you typically have around 4,000 pixels by about 2,000 pixels uh, in that area. And, um, and then you, if you're cutting that in half, you're taking it down to basically like 2K footage instead of 4K footage. And you're bringing down the amount of, uh, of uh, pixels in your in your image. We talked about color information or color depth. You're doing removing color depth from your image as well, color information that are hopefully not necessary, at least to see your initial uh, uh, image. And then the other item is uh, frame rate. Uh, frame rate, people don't usually do frame rate as much as they used to. The earlier days of YouTube, in the other, earlier days of YouTube, like on this first video that was this claimed as the first video that was uploaded to YouTube, you would notice uh, a dip in frame rate. As we play this video back, you can see it's choppy. This is probably playing back about 15, maybe 10, 15 frames per second. Uh, so it's very choppy. But that takes out, if you have a video that plays back at 30 frames per second and you cut it down to 15, you've literally removed half the information and the video will stream easier. 
culture. But that's this is not commonly used anymore. That was back in uh, the earlier days of of uh, YouTube and the, and uh, when the people didn't have as much bandwidth with their internet connection. But typically you are going to be cutting down resolution. If you're shooting 4K, you might want to take it down to like 1920 by 1080 and uh, definitely color, color information. So back to transcoding. Transcoding or optimizing a file to a high, higher quality format such as ProRes uh, does not involve data loss. In fact, you're adding redundant information to a file and therefore it becomes larger as we demonstrated with the, with the drone footage I showed you. That's called lossless compression and I probably shouldn't call it compression just because you're not compressing it. So it's lossless transcoding. Yes, that's what it is. Finally, let's talk about uh, color spacing. Color spacing is kind of important as well, just so you understand some of the language when it comes to some of these uh, intra-frame versus intra-frame compression. You'll hear the word uh, color space every now and then. Color space defines the limits of color gamut, uh, gamma and white point of a, for a particular video standard. That's a, that's some heavy language there, but what we're going to talk. But what's basically happening is is called chroma subsampling. This is another means of compression or bringing down the size of the file by borrowing information from other from other places. And uh, so chroma subsampling is a practice of encoding images uh, by implementing less resolution uh, for chroma information uh, than for luma information, taking advantage of human visual systems lower acuity for color differences than for luminance. Whew. That is a, a mouthful. But I'm going to explain this kind of visually here, just so you can understand the basics. Uh, you'll hear the words uh, 444, 422, and 420. Uh, everybody knows what 4, 420 stands for, but that's not really what it's referring to. It's referring to a type of compression. It's 420. Basically, it comes down to sampling of pixels um, and when which pixels contain information. Uh, what you get with uh, 444, when you hear 444, that's going to be the highest quality of uh, chroma sampling that you can get. And this is measured in block in, in two blocks of four, essentially. It's comparing, it's comparing a row of four pixels compared to a second row of pixels. The first four is basically your sampling. How many pixels you're, tra you're sampling in a row and your computer is your image is being sampled in a row. And if you go and when you've got 444, four, four, basically you've got these two rows of pixels. Four is how many you're sampling, and then your next number here represents your top line, and then your next four, then the last four represents your bottom line. Now, if you got 444, four, four, you've noticed on this top row of four pixels and this bottom row of four pixels that's being sampled here, each block itself is a different color. That's kind of showing that each block has its own color information, that each pixel has its own color information. Then you go to the next row, and once again, each one has its own color information. These are just different colors to represent that every single one of these pixels has its own color information. What this comes down to is it basically means that this image is going to have the highest color acuity of any one of these uh, samples down here because every single pixel basically retains it has its own color information. As you come down to the next block right here, this is 422, uh, you'll notice that uh, you've got, once again, you've got a row of four pixels, but these ones are kind of blended in because uh, this next pixel is borrowing the information from this. So basically it does this uh, with a row of four pixels on the top. Once again, that's your, your sample point. Uh, your, your, your how many pixels we're sampling is going four across. Then the next, the first row up, this next pixel is borrowing from this pixel, and now this pixel is borrowing color information from this pixel. So basically, on this row right here, you're cutting your color depth in half. Uh, now down on the ne now down on the next sample, once again, you've got uh, this pixel here. Then the next pixel will borrow information from this one, and then you've got the third one over here, and the fourth one will borrow from this one here, and that's where you get four two two, because now you've got basically two bits of uh, color information in this sample on top and on the bottom. Now, when it comes down to 420, this is the lowest quality of, of all these images here. And 420 is going to be uh, cameras that are shooting and things like H.264 use 420 compression uh, to shoot. And you'll notice this is 420. So now what you've got on the top row and the bottom row, you've got the zero on the bottom row. So the bottom row is doing the same thing as this pixel here. And all three of these here are just borrowing information from this block right here. And the same over here. So you've got uh, two samples of color uh, where here you've got uh, two on the top row, two on the bottom row. And up here you've, you've got them individually on each individual pixel. So there are cameras 
uh, like I mentioned, the drones, like like I mentioned, DGA drone. Most of the DGA drone uh, kind of prosumer drones that you that you buy will do this four two zero compression. A lot of the, uh, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras that you get for less than a thousand dollars will be uh, com compressing video to four two zero. So they don't have as much color information or as much color acuity uh, or color accuracy. We could also say as the four four four. As you move up to four two two, this is, has increased the color depth uh, exponentially. It's going to be a lot better color image there are a lot of as you get up into uh, like the c200 another camera the canon c200 or uh, the sony fs5 you have opportunities of shooting in 422 uh, if you're especially if you're attaching a an atomos uh, recorder to, to your cameras you're going to get a much better uh, um uh, higher quality that's doing higher color sampling uh, and then you get into the uh, professional cinema cameras like the red camera and now we're shooting 444 or the canon cinema cameras the alexa camera all these uh, just uh, these cinema cameras are going to be sampling in 444 and you're going to have the highest quality uh, possible out of those the, 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 that you're going to get out of any camera so just so you're familiar with the language you know and what you're getting into when you hear these numbers being thrown around and you hear somebody saying oh i'm shooting in 422 is much better quality than 420 now you know hopefully what those are the basics of, of what that is talking about. Well, that's an overview on compression terms, and hopefully that kind of helps you kind of understand what we're dealing with a little bit more. Uh, if you watch the next episode, I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this in, into practice, and we're going to show how to do those compression. You're going to see a lot of the, that language come up, uh, especially in Media Encoder, and uh, kind of show you uh, how to compress a file and how to transcode some files. So um, watch the next episode. Thanks.